All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, uh, AWS Compute Talk. Uh, my name is Matt Garman. I'm the Vice President of the Compute Services for AWS, and uh, super excited to have everyone here. So thanks for coming. So uh, a couple of things. First, uh, I wanted to welcome uh, all customers from all the different industries. Um, everybody uses compute, from startups, enterprises, public sector, ISVs. Companies from a wide range of industries are all building their services on top of compute, on top of AWS. Actually, a quick show of hands. How many of you guys have ever used any compute service for AWS? OK, good. So I don't have to explain what EC2 is. Good. All right. Well, that, that'll get us going quickly. Good. Um, so uh, as many of you guys are aware, uh, AWS has been the leader uh, in the cloud and the compute space for many years. Um, and uh, there's a wide number of analyst reports that you can look at. Uh, I think one of the most entertaining things is actually no matter which analyst you prefer to look at or which report you prefer to look at, um, they keep getting creative ways of trying to explain the cloud market that looks different. Um, it's always either AWS has the best ability to execute, so we have the most complete vision for the space. Um, sometimes they say we have the most capabilities or the best strategy, um, but thanks to all of you, and frankly most important to all of us, is that AWS has the largest number of customers, and that's really the most important thing. Uh, I think one of the most interesting examples of this growth is actually reInvent itself. So in 2012, we had our very first reInvent with 6,000 attendees. Uh, actually, quick show of hands, how many of you guys were here for the very first reInvent? Awesome, that's awesome. And how many of you are here for your first reInvent this year? Fantastic, awesome. Welcome to all of you guys, this is fun. Uh, so yeah, so I heard earlier today, um, I believe this reInvent, we have 43,000 employees, or uh, employees, attendees, not in counting employees, uh, attending reInvent here today. Uh, pretty awesome growth from just 6,000 five years ago. So welcome to everybody. Now at that first reInvent five years ago, we just had a single compute service. It was focused on compute and EC2. And EC2 has been evolving quite rapidly over that time. In fact, if you look back a little longer, in 2007, we had just three instance types that you could launch in EC2 where today we now have more than 70. We've moved from one to 13 different family types, and there's been tons of innovations across those families over the years, uh, some of which I'm gonna talk about today, some of which you might have heard earlier this morning. Now, the compute is at the core of nearly every AWS customer's infrastructure, and whether that's in the form of instances or containers or serverless, um, people have to use compute for nearly everything that they're running. Uh, and within each of these areas, we're rapidly adding complex, uh, new capabilities in fact, the compute ecosystem is pretty vast, from containers to Lambda to HBC to a huge increase in our networking capabilities, new instance types, new management tools. Uh, the compute ecosystem has really been evolving rapidly over the last few years. Uh, I'm gonna dive into every single one of these logos on this slide, um, so you guys should get comfortable. Um, uh, Actually, compute is often, just kidding, I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, compute is often the driving engine that enables companies to build new services and capabilities in the, that really are frankly changing the world. Uh, one example is that companies are often gaining insights into their users in real time using compute in AWS. In healthcare, for example, customers are now able to capture patient telemetry data at the edge, giving doctors the ability to treat illnesses in ways they never could before. One of our customer examples of do, that's doing this on AWS is Cognoa. Cognoa is a mobile app that uses artificial intelligence to identify behaviors in children that are correlated with de developmental delays on, for things like autism. Uh, the initial assessment, even on a mobile phone, is 95% accurate on the app that they have been able to produce. Pretty cool. To date, Cognoa has already helped over 300,000 families and is growing rapidly. All built on AWS. Now, in addition to helping customers innovate, AWS is helping customers achieve compute at scale that was previously impossible. At Clemson University, a group of researchers achieved a remarkable milestone recently. They were conducting some research to look at how human language processing is done on computers, and they needed a ton of cores to in order to do this. Using EC2 Spot within a two-hour window, the Clemson researchers inside of a single region were able to scale their cluster to over 1.1 million cores all using Spot, and were able to complete their research in record time at very low cost. Things like that were never possible before. Now with AWS and EC2, you get continuous innovation all of the time, and that's what goes into a continuous innovation cloud. You get brand new services, brand new capabilities, sometimes invisibly under the covers, sometimes in the form of new capabilities and services, all of the time. Every day your cloud gets better. Now, 
I've been with AWS now for 11 years, and over that time, competitors continuously, every time competitors pop up, they tout their offerings as the next generation cloud. What those competitors often miss is you don't have to settle as customers for V1 or V2 or the next generation of, every, of anything. Continuous innovation means that you're always getting a newer, better offering every single day, and that's what you should expect from a cloud provider. Now, continuous innovation is something that runs deep inside of Amazon. We have a saying inside of Amazon that it's always day one, and that's deep inside of our DNA. Uh, and we firmly believe that in the cloud space, there is significantly more innovation ahead of us than behind us, which makes it super interesting. Now, today I'm going to walk you through a little bit what we think goes into a continuous innovation cloud. But really, all of these things go into our desire to support every single workload for you. We want compute to be able to support anything that you guys can think of in a cloud environment, and that's our overall goal. So I'm going to walk through a couple of the key areas where we think continuous innovation leads us to better able to support your workloads. Now, for us, security is always job one. That is where we always try to start. And we spend an incredible amount of time and effort ensuring that we provide the most secure compute environment possible for all of our customers. Now, when we first launched AWS, we often heard from, AWS, from customers that they were skeptical that they could ever trust the cloud with their really secure data and that they weren't sure can the cloud ever do what they can do inside of their data centers. Well, now, almost all of our customers universally think that they can achieve better security inside of AWS than they can in their own on-premise environments. In fact, this is exactly what Rob Alexander, the CIO of Capital One, said when asked how he thought about how they think about managing their security inside of AWS. Pretty cool that we're able to help them achieve better security than they could themselves in the public cloud. Now we're adding new capabilities around security literally every day. Whether it's networking security, new encryption options, better or more fine-grained IAM controls, standalone security services like Macy that allows you to use machine learning to automatically detect, discover, and classify and protect your sensitive data inside of AWS, um, or potentially it's new compliances that we're launching that are very specific to your particular industry or use case. In fact, AWS has 25% more, 25 more certifications than any other cloud provider, which gives you the tools to improve your security and know that we're always watching out for the particular compliances that are important for you. Security is always our first priority. Now, right after security, we understand that availability is important to your applications. And that's why from the very beginning of AWS, we provided you with availability building blocks so that you could deeply control and isolate sources of uh, failure inside of your applications. We think this is an incredibly important concept. And in fact, oftentimes you'll see that there's global services that other providers have. Global services often sound nice, until they're not, until they fail, and you don't have the ability to, uh, to recover from any failure in a global service. Here at AWS, we've spent the last 10 years hardening our availability and adding locations and capabilities so that you can easily build highly available applications and really control what your availability looks like. How do we think about the infrastructure and isolating there? First of all, we have regions. Regions are completely autonomous, strong isolation, with no data shared, uh, and they protect you from any sort of regional issues that can happen. We have 16 regions around the world with announced plans for six more, including Hong Kong, France, Sweden, a second in China, the Middle East, a second GovCloud region, and many more to come. Inside of each region, we have multiple availability zones. An availability zone is really what you kind of think about in the, in the outside of a cloud world as a data center. It has physical power, has its own physical network infrastructure, completely isolated, and, and very importantly, we think about an availability zone as a very standalone structure. It's not just a logical construct, kind of, kind of sort of isolated inside of a building. It is many miles apart from our other availability zones to ensure that no things like natural disasters can impact two availability zones inside of a region. Today, we offer 44 availability zones around the world with plans for 60 by the end of next year. Now, we have these different building blocks, but customers have also asked us for more granular building blocks. Today, I'm very excited to announce another frequently requested building block by many of our customers in spread placement groups. Now, spread placement groups allow you to place instances inside of availability zone that need to have low latency with each other, but you want them to have independent failure characteristics. Think about a master and a slave database that you don't want to fail by accidentally being on the same physical, same piece of hardware. 
When you put two instances or multiple instances inside of a spread placement group, you can be ensured that all of those instances are on physically separate racks inside of our data center so that you have no single piece of hardware that can fail and cause those instances to fail at the same time, giving you more building blocks to build highly available applications and trade off things like latency and availability. We're really excited about this. And all of this global infrastructure is covered by an industry leading 99.9%, 99.49s <laughs> availability uh, SLA. Now, with the most powerful set of security and availability capabilities that you guys have anywhere, we don't just leave it to you to figure it all out for yourself. AWS has by far the richest set of tools, materials, and in-house resources, and, part, and, a, and as well as a really rich partner ecosystem to help you make the best use of these so you can make sure that your uh, applications are highly available and built to withstand failure. To talk a little bit about how they leverage some of these capabilities to build highly available applications on AWS, please join me in welcoming Chris Drum Drumgool, the CTO from GE. Thanks, Everybody, so uh, hopefully if most of you have heard of GE because you're, when we say GE, you think about uh, your light bulb or your microwave. Um, we don't may even make the microwaves anymore. What people don't realize is the size and scale of GE and the businesses we're in. And at GE, our job is to power, heal, and move the world around. So just to give you a, a little bit of flavor, many of you probably flew here to the meeting today. Uh, if you did fly here, you have over a 65% chance that the two engines powering your plane and keeping you safe and sound and in the air were made by our company. Uh, the electricity in this room right now, as well as the electricity that powers much of the cloud you use with Amazon, whether it's generated by gas, coal, or wind, is being generated by GE equipment to power the world. And if any of you, hopefully it worked out fine, found yourself sick or in the hospital or injured, there's an extremely high likelihood that one of the machines used to either help you or save your life or keep a baby's life alive was made by our company. So as you can see, the mission that we have deep in our DNA at the company is a lot deeper than making sure your french fries are equally heated when they go into the microwave. Uh, and when you live with that DNA, you think about availability and resiliency very, very differently than almost anyone else. Because failure in the businesses we're in, typically in addition to a lot of money lost, often means lives lost. And when that's part of your DNA, you really have to just fundamentally think differently about the way you architect everything in the entire company, including the applications that keep our company alive. So as we've done that, the, our partnership with Amazon goes back many years. And we've really embraced the concept of distributing our workload across their different regions and availability zones. Uh, and I'll just share a little bit without going into a full technical discussion, because I can't, nor would you want me to. But the biggest challenge we had as we went through this is changing the culture of our developers. Because again, when you live with the availability requirements we have, you build things differently. Our data centers are fortresses. Our applications have nine layers of hardware resiliency. It took a long time for us to change our development, a developer's mindset to realize that as opposed to consolidating your environment together and making it as resilient as possible, the key to true resiliency and availability was to spread it apart so that way no individual piece could take down the whole. And the availability zone and region concept has helped us with that uh, with Amazon. So quote it very simply to give you the short order is my advice would be don't overcomplicate it. Uh, we don't quite have a matrix, but the way we think about it is very simply. You draw a chart, and on one side is what happens if it breaks, and on the other side is how much does it cost when that happens. And you put it into four or five different blocks, in our case is nine, and just make that your rule. When you decide wherever your application is in there, that's the, so for us, some applications don't matter. If the cafeteria food scheduling app goes down, we really don't care, it can live in one AZ. Uh, if the app that is providing maintenance for an aircraft engine goes down, it's a big problem. It's in multiple regions, multiple AZs. It's really that simple. We love the tool set. Uh, again, my, my fleeting piece of advice would be really think about the culture change, about how you think about applications differently. That's what we've had to do. We've had great success doing it, as proven by the uptimes that we've been able to generate on the platform. So that's really all of it. Thanks, Matt. Cool. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. It's super exciting to see how GE is using the entire set of capabilities and availability building blocks to, to support really some of the most mission critical applications that exist in the world. Very cool. Now, the second area of continuous innovation that I want to talk about today is driven by, is given customers flexible access to compute power. Now, over the last year, one of the single biggest requests I heard from customers was to provide more flexibility when how we charge for compute time. Now, to that end, we've made a number of improvements this last year. Now, the first one, now, when we first launched EC2 uh, back in 2006, it was completely revolutionary to charge for compute time by the hour. It was something that was completely blew people away. Well, as time has gone on, people have come to expect being able to buy things by the hour. In fact, people were giving us feedback that they wanted to, in fact, buy EC2 time by the minute. Well, we did one better and earlier this year launched per second billing for EC2 and EBS volumes, um, enabling lots of short-lived applications, microservices, um, lots of applications where the compute does not need to run for nearly so long. Another of the biggest pieces of feedback we received from customers is around RIs. Now, customers love the ability to save money with RIs. You can save up to 60% on buying reserved instances uh, for your compute capacity. But customers told us they wanted a little bit more flexibility, and most importantly, we really wanted to simplify the management around their RIs, where there was a lot of effort before. Earlier this year, we launched regional RIs. So for your reserved instances, they no longer had to be tied to a specific size in an instance family or even an availability zone, but you can automatically apply an RI to any instance that was running in that region or and uh, apply it to any size in the family, significantly improving the overhead that people had to spend on RI management. Also this last year, we launched a convertible RI, which lets you convert between instance families, giving customers increased flexibility in the case the needs of your application change, or as the case may be today, we launched new instance types that are a better fit for your application, and you want to change your uh, reserved instance to be for one of those types. Now, finally, one of the unique ways uh, in which AWS makes compute capacity available to our customers is through spot instances. Now, many customers leverage spot instances today when they want access to large amounts of compute capacity. You saw that example from Clemson uh, that I had earlier today. Um, and when customers are flexible of when they can get that work done, spot is really a great fit. Now, previous to today, customers used to have to use a very specific spot workflow, and they had to devise a bidding strategy in order to leverage spot inside of their applications. I'm excited to announce today that we've made launching a spot instance as simple as running an on-demand instance. You can use it through the regular run instance command. We've integrated those spot instances directly into the run instance API uh, that you already use. You can reuse all of the tools, all of the frameworks that you're familiar with and you use for your regular process, but select to launch a, a spot instance synchronously instead of an on-demand instance. Second, we're launching a new no-price bidding model where for up to 90% off of our on-demand rates, you don't need to bid for spot anymore. There will be a market price, you'll get spot instances. We think this will give you much more stable spot prices without the guessing. Finally, and this is something that I'm incredibly excited about, we're introducing the ability to hibernate a spot instance when your spot capacity is reclaimed. Now you don't have to think about, oh, what happens when the work is uh, halfway done and my spot instance gets reclaimed. You can simply hibernate your spot instance, kind of like closing the lid on a laptop, your work will pause, and then you can resume it either by launching it as an on-demand instance or waiting until spot capacity is available again to resume that workload. We think that these things are gonna really open up spot instances to far more workloads than are already being used on spot today, uh, and are really excited to see how you guys uh, go and use spot instances with these new capabilities. Let's see. Now, one of our customers, FuseFX, that's using Spot extensively in their workflow for video rendering. Now, FuseFX Fuse makes heavy use of Spot instances to help them create many of these amazing visual effects for many of their studio uh, and movie customers. They use Spot to help them lower their costs, but also they use Spot to help them parallelize many of their rendering efforts so that they can get their jobs done quickly. Particularly in the movie industry, when people want to reshoot or re redo a scene, Having large amounts of compute capacity available so that you can quickly re-render your videos is incredibly valuable, and especially at low cost. And Fuse has figured out how to integrate Spot as a critical part of their infrastructure in order to provide great service to their customers at low cost. 
For those of you that are interested to learn more about Spot or how to save money uh, using EC2, I encourage you to check out Joshua Burgeon's session uh, later today and tomorrow uh, to do a deep dive on Spot. Now, another of the compute instances or compute types that people are uh, starting to use more and more are containers. This is just a small sample of customers that are running container workloads in production in AWS today. A few of these in particular, uh, Lyft, uh, using uh, ECS as part of their microservices infrastructure on AWS. Lyft also relies on our container registry, the EC2 of uh, the Elastic Container Registry, to durably store container images for use of their applications. Ubisoft has simplified the management of its Storm multiplayer tech platform by using ECS for orchestration and deployment of their applications. And Go GoPro has moved its main cloud platform service, GoPro Plus, to run in Docker containers managed on ECS. GoPro Plus makes it simple for users to capture video and share them with the world. And, they've, and by moving to ECS, they've been able to reduce the complexity of their cloud environment, save money, empower their developers, and reduce their time to market for new additional features. Now, AWS has made a huge investment to make sure that we are far and away the best place to run containers anywhere. Um, and today, we feel that that lead just got a whole lot larger. Now, this year, we've already launched support for native task, work, task networking inside of ECS, integrating with things like security groups and common VPC constructs and ENIs. We've also vastly expanded our region support with ECS, and today, uh, we also offer a native service discovery mechanism inside of ECS built right into the offering. Broadly, our goal with ECS is to continue to make it trivially easy for you guys to run containers and containerized applications inside of AWS at massive scale. Um, giving you the feeling, though, that you're using an AWS native environment, and that is really the key with ECS, having deep integrations with things like IAM, with networking, permissions, et cetera. Now, while customers have told us that for, they love that all that ECS does for them, they wish they still didn't have to think about managing clusters of instances. As announced earlier today in Andy's keynote, AWS Fargate is a container technology platform that allows you guys as customers to simply just run a container task. You don't have to worry about managing instances. You don't have to worry about scaling your cluster. You just hit, you launch the task and pay for the task that you use, all without worrying about cluster management or operating system patching or any of those kind of hassles that you have to deal with today. We're incredibly excited about Fargate and super excited to see how it uh, really enables much easier container application inside of AWS. Now, while we continue to double down on ECS, we also recognize that it's not the only container orchestration framework. In fact, I believe over time there will be several orchestration frameworks that are popular for a variety of different use cases. For those that are interested in native, really native feeling AWS APIs, they'll continue to use ECS and be super excited about the scale they get. But Kubernetes is also one of the most popular container orchestration frameworks. In fact, probably the most popular open source one. In the past year, and over the last four years, we've seen an increasing number of Kubernetes implementations in the cloud running on AWS to now where the majority of them are already running in AWS today. Every year, more and more customers are running Kubernetes applications on top of EC2 and AWS. So our customers are regularly asking us, can we provide that same highly available, well-integrated managed experience for Kubernetes that we do for ECS? Today, also in Andy's keynote, we announced the new Amazon EKS service, which is our managed uh, Kubernetes service. This service is going to be extremely highly available, fully managed, and deeply integrated within the AWS platform, but will have full Kubernetes compatibility, complete with the uh, built on the upstream Kubernetes environment. One of the key features and one of the things that I'm incredibly excited about with uh, EKS is that we'll have full master node redundancy across multiple AZs, so you'll have a zero downtime cluster when you're managed and running uh, on top of the service. Uh, the service launched in preview today. For those of you interested, I encourage you to check it out, uh, and we look forward to that, um, uh, seeing what applications start running there. Now, for a deep dive on all of our containerized applications, I encourage you to check out uh, Deepak's uh, State of the Container State of the Union session, uh, which will be happening tomorrow at the ARIA. Now, the third type of flexible compute that I want to talk about today is Lambda. Lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managing any servers at all. You can run code for virtually any type of application or backend service, all with zero administration. You only pay for the exact compute time you consume, and there's no charge when your code's not running. 
That's part of the reason why Lambda has been incredibly popular since we introduced it several years ago. These are just a few of the companies that are running Lambda at massive scale in production. Companies like Expedia triggering 1.2 billion Lambda requests each month. The Seattle Times uses Lambda to resize images for viewing on different devices like a laptop or a, a phone uh, or a tablet. Zillow uses Lambda and Kinesis to track a subset of their mobile metrics and they track those in real time. Bustle uses a serverless backend using AWS Lambda and API Gateway to run both their website and their mobile app. And most impressively, FINRA uses Lambda to run 75 billion financial transactions every single day through Lambda. Pretty awesome, the scale that some of these guys are able to achieve. Now, it may not surprise you, we're making lots of investment in the serverless space as well to make Lambda the best place to do data processing and run serverless backends. This last year, Lambda is now present. We've launched Lambda in nearly every single region, including GovCloud. We support the li largest compliance programs, including SOC, PCI, ISO, HIPAA, and a whole bunch of other alphabet soup, uh, making it available to the most regulated workloads. We've made it easier to develop Lambda functions, starting with integrated support for Lambda with CodeStar. We've launched the ability for you to develop Lambda applications locally on your desktop and then push them up to the cloud after you've ensured that they'd work as you're expecting. We also have uh, launched GAs for things like Greengrass and Lambda at the Edge so that you can really get low latency applications at the edges of your application. And we've launched GA support for X-Ray so that you can ensure that your Lambda applications are running as they expect. Finally, we've raised the default currency concurrency rate to 1,000 to support the trend of, of customers running denser and denser applications in Lambda. We're incredibly excited about the advances that we've made in Lambda, and I encourage you to check out Tim Wagner's uh, uh, address on serverless applications as the general manager of Lambda, uh, which is tomorrow also in the ARIA. All right, so as we continue to innovate, the next step in what goes into a continuous innovation cloud is we wanna make the capabilities that we provide accessible to all of our customers. We want to provide you all of the capabilities you need to run your application, but without exposing you, to all of the complexity that isn't important to you for your particular use case. That's a hard goal, but we have a couple of th things that we're doing to try to make that easier. Number one is we try to make it easier for particular vertical segments. Deadline is an industry-leading pro product used by the, our media and rendering companies to manage complex rendering workflows. We recently released Deadline 10, which deeply integrates the management capabilities that media companies have come to expect with the power to seamlessly use AWS to accomplish the work that they need to do. By leveraging the native integration of spot instances into Deadline, for example, Buddha Jones was able to leverage all of the software that they needed, Jigsaw running on Windows instances in particular, and they used that uh, ability to burst into spot to reduce the time they needed to render the amazing visual effects in the Wonder Woman movie. Normally, the visual effects here would have taken a thousand days for them to do, or more likely, frankly, they probably just wouldn't have done the work because it wouldn't have been possible. They were able to get that time down to four days on Spot without ever actually needing to learn how Spot worked or even EC2 for that matter, just using the software that they were already using. Similarly, another vertical is in HPC where we're making it easier to use. Now, HPC customers typically love to use and are super excited about using the power of AWS to accomplish their work, but they're typically scientists, and they don't really want to learn anything about AWS or EC2. They want to focus on their projects, not learning how to use the cloud. AWS Batch automatically sets up HPC workloads for customers. Customers automatically get the benefits of things like auto-scaling, HIPAA compliance, uh, spot integration, and CloudWatch and uh, cloud formation, job scheduling, et cetera. All they have to do is define the work they need, what they want done, when they need it done, and AWS Batch, Batch does the rest. Uh, we're really pushing the edge of what you can do on HPC in the cloud today. Uh, we've launched an AWS optimized MPI library for tightly coupled applications. And today we're excited to announce native support for array workloads inside of the batch service, which is one of the things that our HPC customers were incredibly excited about. Similar to what we've done with Deadline, EngineFrame is a popular application used for rendering on premise. We've built in integrations to H uh, into AWS, into engine frames that you can easily burst from using your on-premise engine frame, which is a popular HPC application, into AWS uh, and EC2. Now, Batch makes HPC easier and, but, but, and, uh, and for the one end, but at the other end, customers were telling us that they wanted an easier way to use just a simple VPS-style offering. 
They just wanted to put up a WordPress or have a simple project without giving up any of the security, reliability, or performance that they've come to expect inside of their AWS environment. Last year at reInvent, we introduced LightSail, which gives you a simple bundled product of compute, storage, and data transfer, all for a simple monthly price. Literally with a single click in LightSail, you can create a fully configured WordPress instance and get started going on your project. If your project ever starts to scale and you need all of the rich feature set that you would get from normal AWS or EC2 offering, it's incredibly easy to migrate that product over and take advantage of the full AWS experience. Now the response to LightSail has been tremendous and the team has been hard at work adding new capabilities to LightSail with a clear focus not to increase, increase any of the complexity. We've added more languages, we've added 10 global regions, and we've added the ability for you to add EBS volumes to your LightSail. In addition, we've added support for Windows OSs, which has been incredibly popular as customers continue to flock to AWS to run Windows applications, and LightSail makes that incredibly easy to use. Now, the, the team amazingly isn't slowing down, though, and today I'm pleased to announce the availability uh, the availability to provision a light sale load balancer for a flat monthly rate. Now we took all of the technology scalability that customers have come to expect from ELBs and we simplified the configuration and management to make it trivially easy to use a load balancer in light sale. Light sale load balancers automatically are configured and ready to route traffic to healthy instances in minutes through the light sale console or CLI. Light cell uh, load balancers automatically include integrated certificate management. They provide a free SSL certificate that can be easily provisioned with just a few clicks. Now, LightSail is free to try for the first month, so any of you that have not yet tried LightSail, I encourage you to try it out. Uh, it's a, one of the simplest ways to get started with AWS and EC2, uh, and it's free for the first month, so I want you guys to go give it a try for that project that you've been wanting to start or just try and play around with. Now those are a couple of examples of how we've been continuously innovating to make things easier for particular customer segments. But it's super important for us to remember that we want to keep innovating for our developers too, giving you guys tools that make it easier to build complex applications on top of AWS, not just simple ones. Now often when I speak with developers, one of the missing pieces that they really need for large distributed systems is a mechanism to accurately make sure that different parts of their application are running at the same, tr same time. Today, I'm very pleased to announce the launch of the Amazon TimeSync service. The TimeSync service offers a time source accessible from within your VPC without requiring any sort of additional configuration. It's automatically available to all of your instances. It's available globally uh, today, and it's available free of charge. The Amazon TimeSync service provides dedicated Amazon-managed time hardware, including satellite-connected atomic clocks, and it's all run in the highly available Amazon infrastructure. I'm really excited to see what kind of different applications this highly accurate time sync service uh, can bring and allow you to do, uh, and I encourage you guys to try it out with your applications today. Additionally today, uh, as many of you guys have used EC2 already, you know that we provide an incredibly rich set of options when you launch an instance. We allow you to pick an instance option like size. We allow you to pick from a wide range of operating systems. You can produce custom AMIs. When you launch your application, you can pick EBS volumes. You can define block device mappings. You can select which VPC or subnet you launch into. Uh, you can apply tags. You can apply user data, et cetera. There is an incredibly rich set of options when you're launching an instance. However, with all that flexibility, that's a lot of options to think about every time you launch an EC2 instance. Today, I'm excited to announce a new capability in EC2 with launch templates. We don't want you to lose any of that flexibility, but now we've made it much easier for you to take advantage of it. You can now define all of your launch time parameters or leave some of them as launch time options into a versioned launch template. Now, a couple of cool things about launch templates that I think are important to emphasize. One is that with launch templates, you can apply access controls. This means that for developers inside of your organization, you can define IAM access controls that says your developers are only able to launch from a series of launch templates, and you can define some guardrails around which they're able to use EC2. Maybe they're only allowed to launch in a certain subnet, or they're only allowed to launch certain instance types. One of the other key things that I think is incredibly interesting is because these are versioned, you can also define the AMI that your, that your developers inside of your organization launch, ensuring that they're always launching on the most up-to-date patched 
AMI that you have. You can, even have, you can even define a current alias AMI that they use, and under the covers in your IT organization, uh, point it at a new AMI when you want, there's a new golden image that you want everyone to start from. We think that launch templates are gonna give developers tools to significantly ease a lot of their ability to launch uh, applications uh, and infrastructure. Launch templates are gonna be able to be used uh, today inside of auto scaling. Uh, and allow you and your organizations to increase the compliance around using AWS in the cloud. Uh, there's a deep dive session uh, that can give you much more details on launch templates and how you can integrate those into your workflows and applications uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I encourage you guys to check this out. All right. The next section. Part of continuous innovation is raising the bar on performance. Everybody wants things that are faster, cheaper, bigger, better. And AWS has far and away the highest performing, most fully featured network in particular in the cloud. Now, we're constantly innovating at all of the layers of our network. And for those of you who were able to catch Peter DeSantis' keynote last night, you heard him talk about the incredible innovation that we're doing under the covers inside of our network. One of the most obvious ways that this manifests itself is through on-instance networking. Now, when we first introduced our first compute instance, C1, they came with one gigabit of oversubscribed network, and that was used for both network and EBS storage. As we've introduced new families over time, we've radically increased the amount of network to where, and while also dramatically reducing any potential congestion that occurs inside of our internal networks. Network bandwidth now has increased to 25 gigabits with our latest instances on C5. We have an additional nine gigabits of dedicated bandwidth for EBS, so your networking and EBS bandwidth doesn't conflict with each other. And all of this is, exists inside of a completely non-blocking network between nodes inside of our data center. In addition, we've also increased the bandwidth between S3 and EC2, so that you can get full network connectivity between that without being, uh, so that you can have faster access to much of your data that resolves inside of EC2. In addition to increasing the, the uh, throughput of the network, we've significantly reduced the latency. Back when we first launched C1, latency between two nodes was several hundred microseconds between nodes inside of an AZ, and with C5, that number is well below 50 microseconds, and we continue to push that down over time. Now previously, a couple of months ago, we introduced the ability for customers to access AWS services privately from within, inside of their VPC, called PrivateLink. We've had this capability actually with S3 for a while now. An interesting, an interesting stat for you is as of today, more than 50% of all network traffic from S3 travels over private endpoints. That's how popular that offering has been with our customers. Now today, we're exci incredibly excited to talk that customers can now create private link endpoints for all of their own services and make them available to others. Now we see two big use cases that customers are really excited about in using private link. The first is their ability to access third-party SaaS applications via private link. Now, customers used to have to choose. Do you want to open up your VPC to the public internet if you want to, in order to access some valuable third-party SaaS offering that you wanted to use, or you had to choose not to use that service at all if you didn't want to open your VPC to the internet? Now, you don't have to make that choice. With the ability to access services from Cisco, Autodesk, Heroku, via private connectivity, you don't need for your sensitive data to be ever to be exposed to the internet in order to use those services. The second big use case for using private link is as a way to vastly simplify your internal networks. As the world and many of your applications have moved more towards a microservices world, we see many of our customers running in multiple VPCs and often many multiple accounts where many of their services are isolated by VPC or account. This has created a problem for many of our customers in, in communicating between those different VPCs and services. Uh, as a way to solve that, historically, you've needed to use VPC peering, which often gets complicated as you get more and more services that you need to peer between. Now, with private link, you're able to create private links for those services and simply map those into the other VPCs that need access to those internal services. This vastly simplifies your network uh, architecture and also allows you to better reason about what services are able to access other services and make sure that you have really locked down tight controls of your internal network and your services. Super excited about what Private Link is able to do and how it's going to be able to how you allow you guys to further secure your applications. Now I'd like to ask Rini Santi to come join me up on the stage 
as she, uh, Chief Product Offi uh, Security Officer for Autodesk, and she's going to come talk with me, and we're going to chat a little bit about how many of these features are helping her increase the security for Autodesk and for their customers. Welcome. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for asking me to join you. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think people would be super interested to hear a little bit um, about Autodesk, about what are some of the key challenges that you guys deal with uh, when you're thinking about delivering your services as SaaS offerings to your customers and how their, maybe their expectations have changed a little bit uh, with regards to you and your services. Sure. So before I <clears throat> address the, the expectations question, mm -hmm. let me set a little bit of a context of uh, who Autodesk is. Yep. <clears throat> so for those of you who attended last night's keynote, you got a little bit of a glimpse of that with what Brian Matthews presented. And uh, at Autodesk, uh, we are building tools and products to enable our customers to imagine design and create a better world. Now, this sounds like a very uh, pie-in-the-sky statement. I completely understand that. But in reality, uh, if in today's world you think about buying something, you go to Amazon. Our vision is to make sure that if uh, you want to make something, you want to build something, you come to Autodesk. And uh, our footprint uh, from an Autodesk perspective is uh, in the world's you know, cities and bridges and roads and buildings and even uh, the, your most favorite uh, media and entertainment movies and, and television shows, et cetera. Over the course of the last uh, few years here, we have been moving in the direction of uh, from a desktop product footprint to extending into the cloud and providing our services via the cloud to our customers. Because we fundamentally believe that the massive compute power and data that the cloud provides to our customers will enable them to do better and more improved rendering and generative design and simulation in the cloud. Now, coming back to your question about the challenges and some of the, the questions that our customers are asking us, now they're super excited about using our capabilities in the cloud. Mm -hmm. But along with that, they have the same challenges, which I categorize them as basic necessities of cloud computing, performance, availability, scalability, and security. So they want to use our cloud services, but they want the assurance that we are providing to them a secure and reliable and performant infrastructure behind it. Uh, makes total sense. And uh, I think that the audience would love to hear, and I'd love to hear a little bit about what are the AWS services um, that are helping you do that for your customers. So first and foremost, I know you showed some slides about where Gartner you know, puts you in the, in the magic yeah. quadrant. So we fundamentally believe that AWS is a leading provider of enterprise cloud services. Uh, you under understand and acknowledge what enterprise cloud really looks like. And our collaboration with you, you understand what we need from you, and uh, you're very much invested in the success of us as well as our customers. Now, some of the capabilities that I will talk about, and I mentioned earlier, basic necessities of cloud computing, mm -hmm. one of them I'll pick apart is security, just because it's very close to my heart. And on the security front, some of the capabilities you guys have provided, AWS has recently provided, uh, be it CloudTrail or Guard Duty. Uh, these are capabilities that end us providing us near real-time insight into what's happening in our environment, into what's happening in our uh, various user accounts that we may have. Guard Duty does a really good job of integrating uh, uh, you know, VPC flow logs with CloudTrail events, and that enables my security team to be able to go out and figure out which specific incidents they really should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And then on the compliance front, it also, CloudTrail gives me the ability to go out and actually provide audit log capabilities for any of the alphabet soup compliance <laughs> uh, certifications that you were asked, talking about earlier, be it ISO 2701 or SOC 2. Macy is yet another capability I would like to talk about because that enables us to do categorization of S3 data. Mm -hmm. And with the uh, compliance regulations like GDPR looming up, for all the, the, the folks in the audience from Europe, 
Uh, GDPR is uh, something that we need to comply to by May 2018. Yep. And uh, Macy, because of the way it categorizes personally identifiable information, it enables us to meet a lot of requirements on the GDPR front as well. So these are all the, I think I've given you a good broad brush yep. of the capabilities we're using. Yeah, awesome, it's cool. Uh, Autodesk, you guys use uh, a really wide swath of the services we provide, which is, which is fun and great for us to learn from. Uh, so one last quick question. Um, of some of the things you've heard from today and, and this week, uh, what are some of the new things that are coming out uh, that you're most excited about trying out with for Autodesk? So let's talk Private Link, mm -hmm. obviously, okay. because, uh, and you announced that very recently. Mm -hmm. Now, Private Link, uh, for us at Autodesk, we have hundreds of uh, developer teams building and producing you know, products and applications and services into the cloud and using VPCs, et cetera. It provides us a very safe, reliable, secure, private connectivity between VPCs, and that enables our developers to uh, do that, use that private connectivity for shared services and microservices. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'm um, very excited to, to explore further with Private Link is what you were talking about earlier with our partner and customer ecosystem, mm -hmm. and using Private Link with, with them as well. And lastly, I will say, uh, I want to continue the collaboration with you guys. You understand what our customers require from us. And together, I think, with the capabilities you provide on the security and compliance front, that enables us to have and to provide that assurance to our customers that we understand their challenges and that together we are here to address those challenges for them. Awesome. Thank you so much. You guys Thank are you. doing some really cool stuff, and we really appreciate Thank it. You, Thank Matt. you so much. Now, to learn a little bit more about how we're continuously innovating in the network, uh, I encourage you to actually check out Dave Brown's session on EC2 networking. Uh, that's actually uh, today, this afternoon, following this session here in the Venetian. Now, the final critical component to continuous innovation is to provide you guys with seamless access to new technology innovations. Now, at Amazon, we don't simply build technology for technology's sake. Fully 90% of the items on our roadmap that we build come clearly from customer requests. And frankly, the other 10% are us innovating on behalf of customers, solving problems for them in totally new ways that they may not have even thought of. Now, one of the very clear ways that this manifests itself is in our instance delivery, where every year we ensure that you have the absolute latest and greatest platforms on which to build your applications. Now, I'm not going to go through every single instance uh, that we have launched this past year, but I'm going to point out a couple of the highlights. Earlier this year, we launched our very first FPGA instance in the cloud with our F1 instance. Just a few months ago, Etico and the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia set a new world record for the fastest analysis of 1,000 genomes using F1s. Only a couple of years ago, it cost tens of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars in order to process a genome. Etico got this cost to th down to $3 a genome using F1 and AWS. We also launched G3 instances, our newest instances that support 3D rendering and graphic workloads. And they enable customers like Halliburton to render visual simulations for seismic exploration and analysis for their oil and gas customers that were previously never possible. Most recently, we launched P3, our new GPU compute instances. We are the only cloud, and frankly, the only place other than direct from NVIDIA, that offers the new NVIDIA Volta V100 processors, which for machine learning applications can provide a 14x increase in performance. That's right, 14 times faster from any of your machine learning workloads. Now, the market growth is for machine learning and AI is immense. The world is producing an incredible amount of data. 1.2 trillion pictures will be taken this year, 100,000 chatbots will be created, and an estimated 44 zettabytes of data will be created by 2020. It's really even hard to get your head around. Now, for those of you that are going to make any sense at all of this data, it's critically important that you always have access to the latest technologies. And with AWS, you get access to that technology often before it's available for you, even if you wanted to buy it through traditional means. In addition to giving you the access to the latest technology from industry, we're working hard to make our underlying platforms better. Quick show of hands, how many of you guys are familiar or have ever used a T2 instance for EC2? Awesome, great. So T2 instances are our low-cost general purpose instance. They provide a baseline level of CPU performance with the ability to burst above the baseline. Now, T2 instances, they're the lowest cost instance we have, and they're ideal for things like web servers, developer environments, and small databases. However, many of our customers told us that while they love the performance and cost that they get out of a T2, they either found that they were using a bigger T2 instance than they needed just to get more burst credits, 
or they decided that they couldn't really use them for production applications at all since they couldn't afford to have a situation where the instance runs out of burst credits if it comes under unusually heavy load, say your blog or your web page gets a lot of traffic, or maybe you had a, a batch process that happened at the end of the month that was bigger than you expected. Today, we're incredibly excited to announce T2 Unlimited. This is the ability for any T2 instance to turn on T2 Unlimited. You can do it in an existing instance or at launch time. And it allows you that when you hit your burst credits, we don't throttle you, but you keep going. We charge you a small per second rate for any time that you use above your burst credits. And when you come back down from that spike, you continue with all of the existing credits at the same price that you were using for the T2 instance. Now, never run out of T2 credits ever again. Uh, pretty excited. I think this is going to really open up the use cases and really the production use cases that you're going to be able to run with T2 instances, allowing you to significantly lower your costs where you may have been having to use bigger instances or other instance types. Big data is one of the most popular areas that customers frequently run on AWS. Today, we also announced a new instance family called H1. H1 instances are tailor-made for big data workloads. They provide a balanced amount of memory and compute uh, CPU, and they have 16 terabytes of local spinning disk. Now, these are perfect for big data workloads like Hadoop, HDFS-style workloads, uh, as well as streaming applications for those of you running things like uh, Apache Kafka clusters. Um, I encourage you, H1 instances are available today, and I encourage you guys to go check those out. Now, several years ago, we started an effort to completely reimagine our virtualization infrastructure inside of EC2, which, on which we call the Nitro system. The idea was that traditionally, a hypervisor has to do a ton of things. It has to, pr to protect physical hardware and BIOS. It has to virtualize CPU. It has to virtualize network. It has to virtualize the storage. Uh, and it has to provide a rich set of management capabilities so that you can manage your underlying hardware. With Nitro, our idea was that we could break apart all of these functions into separate components, providing you better performance for our customers, providing better security, and allowing us to reduce costs, passing that benefit on to you without having to hold back some of the resources on the server for our management software. So that's what we did. Iteratively, over time, we delivered value to our customers, first offloading our network processing with enhanced networking in C3 to an uh, offload, uh, Nitro system, and then we offloaded storage with EBS. Later, with i3, we actually offloaded the ability to manage local disks into our Nitro system. All of this was no longer controlled by the hypervisor, but instead an off-box separate card Nitro system with custom-designed silicon as part of the Annapurna uh, chip design. For those of you who were in Peter's talk last night, he talked a little bit more in depth about this. Now, one of the things that this allowed us to do, uh, and finally with C5, oh, next one, uh, we launched two new instance types recently, C5 a couple of weeks ago and M5 today. These are brand new Nitro-based systems where we've taken the final step where all of the management that was done by the hypervisor has also been moved into the Nitro system. Now, really all that hypervisor is doing for these instances is simply virtualizing CPU. As part of that, we launched a brand new Nitro hypervisor where we strip out all the extraneous pieces that we no longer need, and we have a, pur a purpose-built hypervisor that is custom designed for our own environment and gives you incredibly low jitter uh, and great performance on our new platforms. Super excited, encourage you guys to go try these out. Part of the benefits that we deliver through all of this Nitro uh, program is we're able to get, uh, deliver all of the memory and all of the cores on the instances to you, the customers. That delivers a 25 to 50% price performance benefit of C5 and M5 over previous generations. Um, and better performance. Super excited for you guys to go check those out. Now what this also means is the only thing the hypervisor is doing uh, is, protect <laughs> is protecting the hardware. Um, that means we can remove the hypervisor and give you guys bare metal. We announced last night the introduction of EC2 bare metal. Now this is not just a reimagining or repackaging of traditional hosting. Because of all of the work we've done over the last four years with, the, with Nitro, um, we're actually able to deliver bare metal actual instances. You can use all the VPC constructs, you can attach ENIs, you can put them inside of your uh, security groups, you can attach EBS volumes, every fast launch times, everything that you've come to expect from EC2 instance, you get with bare metal. And additionally, however, and most importantly, we never compromise on security. 
So as part of Nitro, we actually built a custom-designed Nitro security processor that's on the server motherboard that ensures that the BIOS that boots with the server does not contain malware, has not been tampered with in any way, and is exactly the signed code that we expect. This is the type and level of security you should expect from your cloud providers, and it's what we deliver as part of continuous innovation inside of the cloud. Now, this is just a quick overview of the number of key innovations that we're bringing to you in our efforts to support every single complete workload out here. Here to talk about how AWS has helped them support their own wide range of workloads over the past nine years is Heroku CEO and Salesforce SVP, Adam Gross. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for letting me take a couple minutes to talk about our journey with AWS. So as some of you know, Heroku celebrated its 10th anniversary this summer. And Heroku, uh, for those of you who don't use it, is a tool that developers use to really get a great experience for building and running their applications. And all of that capability that we do in Heroku has always been based on uh, uh, EC2. And it's with uh, the benefit of EC2 that we've been able to scale to support millions of developers and millions of applications. So uh, if nothing else, our experience and our journey is hopefully a, a proof case of how far you can get, how big you can go, running uh, thousands and thousands of EC2 instances, and uh, how sophisticated the management and deployment of those can be. Where it gets even more exciting for me is to think about how that work is extending across the broader Salesforce uh, platform, which many of you may use, and ultimately what that means for you in creating new applications to connect with your customers. Uh, you are, if you're a Salesforce customer today, you're probably using AWS under the hood in a way that you might not be aware. We run uh, core Salesforce, so our sales cloud and our service cloud, on AWS in certain regions like Australia. Uh, in Canada, and also for some of our newer marketing cloud products like uh, Salesforce DMP. The part, though, that for me is most exciting, as Matt was alluding to before, is really what that means for your ability to use the AWS features you know and love, as well as all the new ones we're learning about at the show, to build ways of extending your Salesforce applications and ultimately solve uh, and create new ways of connecting to your customers. We want to make it possible for you to use all the stuff uh, that Matt and others are introducing to create new opportunities to connect and grow your customer relationships. And that's why technologies like Private Link are so important. We want to be able to allow you to securely connect the SaaS applications that we provide, the services that we provide on Heroku, which include special data integration capabilities to bidirectionally synchronize your data from Salesforce into common open source tools like Postgres, and ultimately connect that to other resources that you have running in Amazon uh, but do that in a way that maintains, of course, the trust that's so important for the security that your organizations need. And while that's been possible before via a variety of kind of uh, network configurations and things like VPC um, pairing, today with Private Link, we're really excited with the opportunity to make that much more simple and much more common. So I encourage you, if you're uh, AWS and Salesforce customers, uh, to take a look at the work we're doing in Heroku to bring those worlds together and look forward to seeing what you guys built. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. It's been great to have you guys as a customer from uh, the very early days, and it's been fun to see you uh, grow along with us. It's very fun. Now, if we think about supporting every workload and what that really means, one of the things that that means is we support third-party software, everything that our customers need, from Windows to Red Hat to IBM to Oracle to the most number of instances that are certified to run SAP, including instances with up to four terabytes of memory that support SAP, work, SAP HANA workloads, to support for things like F5, Cisco, Tableau, Teradata, et cetera. Our desire is to support any and every third-party software partner on AWS, and we're working very hard to ex expand that support every single day. In addition, our customers, as you, as you may have seen, are not just in the technology industry. They span gaming, healthcare, financial services, retail, nonprofits, public sector. One of the cool things to see is literally every industry at this point has companies that are running inside of AWS. For an in-depth view on how large enterprises in particular are running their production workloads on EC2 and AWS, please check out Sandy Carter's State of the Union uh, at the MGM tomorrow. What's next? The most exciting part is we're just getting started. We have an incredibly ambitious roadmap of new instance types, new networking capabilities, global expansion, and new additional services that we're planning for the next year and able to help you better focus on the applications that differentiate your business. 
Now, I know that that was a pretty quick overview. Uh, today, we've covered a lot, broad swath of things. There's a number of new capabilities that we've introduced in the compute space. Uh, this is just a quick summary of some of the most recent launches that we announced today and have announced over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I encourage those of you to go and check them out. Uh, in addition, we've put up a page of where to learn more. For more details and pointers on in-depth information on any of the new areas I talked about today, please see our reInvent announcement page. Uh, and if you go to the compute category, you can see a really deep dive there. Um, finally, for those of you that are new to AWS and are looking at how to try it out for the first time, I really encourage you to go try to sign up for a LightSail account. It is the single easiest way to get started on AWS. And if you're looking for a really low cost way, I encourage you to even go try and launch a spot instance just to see what that experience is like as a really inexpensive way to try out many of our new EC2 instances. Thank you guys, I uh, really appreciate it and I hope you enjoy the rest of the week.